All right, everybody, this is In Liberty and Health. I'm going to do a little solo cast here. Um, in case anybody doesn't know or hasn't been made uh, clear, um, I'm a huge advocate of resistance training and um, eating high amounts of protein to build lean tissue, right? So this episode, we're going to break down um, a little bit of like protein and training recommendations. And we're even going to go over a little bit of what I do personally. Sorry, my dogs are barking. They're, um, they're assholes, and I'm a huge advocate of dogs as well. <laughs> um, part of the reason for that is because I absolutely love walking my dogs. Um, right now in Pennsylvania, it's pretty freaking cold, and there's a lot of snow, so I can't exactly take dogs out for a walk. Um, but in my honest opinion, and there's a lot of research to back this up, um, why is it so important to have muscle mass, and why am I such an advocate for resistance training and building muscle? Um, as you build muscle, um, you will typically get a higher metabolism, right? So you'll be able to eat more calories without gaining weight. Um, you'll survive longer, right? Because grip strength, we know, directly correlates with mortality. I believe I did a video on that a couple months ago. So go ahead and scroll down on the YouTube channel to find that. And um, you're just overall healthier. You feel better. You look better. Um, I'm sure everybody who's ever worked out kind of noticed whenever you... Um, first start resistance training, everybody kind of notices that you put on a little bit of muscle. Um, we're also going to cover kind of the newbie gains, right? Um, in your first year or so of training, you'll gain a significant amount of muscle. And then um, it's kind of purported that you'll gain about half the muscle you're ever going to gain throughout your entire life within that first year. So we're going to cover that too. Um, I personally do a six day a week training split and I spend lots of time walking on the treadmill in the colder weather and lots of time walking outside when it's warmer. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that too, probably, but um, without further ado, we'll start kind of rolling through some articles. Um, if anybody wants to know kind of who I look to, to get a lot of this information, um, Lane Norton would be one, Brett Contreras, Alan Aragon, um, Mike Isretail is a huge one. He's been on the podcast. He's absolutely phenomenal. Um, Brett Schoenfeld, um, even like Sean Baker, some of the low carb keto guys um, who aren't, you know, low carb keto is generally not associated with um, building muscle because, you know, you typically think of the, the tilapia, chicken breast, and white rice six times a day for the guys who build muscle in the kind of bodybuilding world. But um, you can do that without doing that. And you can build muscle without carbohydrates, but um, carbohydrates just tend to be very protein sparing. So, um, you know, it's a lot of people go for that. Um, the other thing is that carbohydrates also fill what's called your glycogen stores, which is a form of energy that you use um, at a higher heart rate to you know, when you do a lot of effort. So let's say you go to do some deadlifts or something like that, something that's going to require a lot of energy. You're going to go through what's called your muscle glycogen and carbohydrates replenish that when you eat them. And I'm, I'm going to dumb a lot of this stuff down. I mean, already the way I'm talking is very dumbed down just for everybody to kind of understand what I'm getting at here. But um, I just want to kind of lay all this stuff out there for people who may be considering training or uh, starting to resistance train or for people who just don't know this stuff and are uh, interested in learning. So um, let me do a little screen share here and we will start kind of rolling through here. Uh, share. All right, so I just did a simple Google search as you can see, um, what is protein? Um, and in case anybody doesn't know, you have your macronutrients, right? Protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Um, protein is four calories per gram approximately on average. Carbohydrates are four calories per gram on average normally. And fats are nine calories per gram on average usually, right? And, and I know that that's a, a whole ton of word salad, but um, they can be a little bit less. They can be a little bit more, but just kind of for a safe guideline, go for that. As you can see accidents here whacking me around. <laughs> so proteins are large biomolecules and macromolecules that, comprom or that comprise one or more long chains of amino acid residues. Um, and the function, protein has many roles in your body. It helps repair and build your body's tissues, allows metabolic reactions to take place, and coordinates bodily functions. In addition to providing your body with a structural framework, proteins also maintain proper pH and fluid balance. Um, carbohydrates and fats are just more of energies, right? 
protein is not a good form of energy because um, it's more so the building block, right? So um, just to kind of lay out a pretty broad brush scenario, let's say you go into the gym and you do a whole ton of bicep curls till you absolutely can't anymore, right? It's your first time ever going to exercise. You just hammer these freaking bicep curls. So um, if you were just to eat carbohydrate and fat with no protein, then your body essentially wouldn't have the building blocks per se to rebuild that connectile to, or that connective tissue to um, repair itself and come back stronger. So you need to eat protein. Um, we're also going to go over the uh, benefits of protein in this podcast as well. Um, like I said, I'm just a very, very huge advocate of protein. So um, we're also going to cover kinds of proteins and which kinds of proteins you should eat. Personally, I'm a very big advocate of animal foods and even protein powders and um, as well as dairy products. The plant-based proteins, I have nothing against them, but um, to trigger what's called muscle protein synthesis, which is the process where your body starts to build um, additional contractile tissue, um, you need to hit about three grams of leucine, which is a specific amino acid that's found um, in the right amounts in animal foods versus plant foods. So when you take a plant protein, you don't get the same amino acid content that you do in animal foods. So therefore you have to eat more of said plant proteins to get to that three grams of leucine to trigger muscle protein synthesis. All right, so moving on here. Um, this is the digestible indispensable amino acid score or DIAS score that basically goes over the quality of proteins. So as we could see, whey protein isolate is number one. So you go to GNC, you go to Walmart, you go to um, vitamin shop, wherever, um, insert uh, vitamin store, or whatever supplement store here, or even just go on like Redcon One, um, tigerfitness.com, uh, anywhere really, you're gonna find protein powders. And a lot of them are gonna be whey protein isolate, whey protein concentrate, those are going to be your kind of main two. Um, they're about the best absorbing proteins that your body could take. Um, so yeah, whey protein isolate, concentrate, milk protein concentrate, skim milk protein, whole milk protein, casein. Casein is a little bit of a slower digesting one. So um, what some people recommend is that you take this before bed. So that way your body gets a more evenly distributed um feed of amino acids while you sleep. And then in the morning, obviously you make a breakfast and eat. Um, we'll talk a little bit about fasting here and why personally I used to think it was a good idea, but I no longer do. Um, cow milk, sheep milk, goat milk, um, whole egg, beef, pork, chicken breast, tilapia. So you can see pretty much all the animal foods are going to be your best source of protein. And those also come with, typically with fats, right? Or if you go to a lot of restaurants, they may bread them and add carbohydrate to it, right? Um, the reason why these foods, um, why I, I'm not a fan of kind of processed food or foods that you may get in restaurants is because the caloric content of processed foods or when they add carbohydrates to animal foods is that now you increase the calories, but you actually decrease the amount of satiety you get from said calories, right? If you look at a plain chicken breast or let's say even like a lean cut of steak, you'll only eat so much of that by itself. If you put some salt on it, it's going to decrease the satiety, but you're going to get a little bit more flavor. If you put barbecue sauce all over chicken or bread it, then you just add a ton of carbohydrates and now you're not going to be as satiated when you eat that because um, carbohydrates and fats together tend to be very, very easy to overconsume. And now that's not to say you should never be eating a caloric excess, but it depends on your goals. A lot of people are typically looking to lose weight. So you're going to want to eat in a caloric deficit, right? So when you eat in a caloric deficit, then you're in a negative energy balance and therefore you will lose fat. Now, if you're not careful and you eat too little protein and are in a caloric deficit, then you can actually lose equal amounts of um, muscle and fat, which is what we don't want to do. We want to maintain as high of lean mass as possible and as minimal fat mass as possible. Um, now, when you want to increase calories and be in a caloric excess, that's going to be the most conducive environment for building muscle. But at the same time, you're going to have to accept that it's going to come at the cost of some body fat gain as well. Um, it just depends on your long-term goals and kind of what you're looking for. So I know there's a long tangent, but um, you can see right here, it says non-animal derived foods. Um, soy is going to be your best bet when it comes to proteins. 
um, soy protein isolate, as you can see, is number one. They're still good. Um, I've tried some soy proteins. Personally, I do not like the taste of them. I'm sure there's some out there that I may like, but um, last time I remember having them, I really did not like them. Um, soy flour, wheat, um, you can just kind of see all the animal foods and then, or um, all the uh, plant foods. Um, corn-based breakfast cereal, roasted peanuts, cooked kidney beans are your lowest source, right? So you would have to eat a much greater amount of these plant proteins or the non-animal derived proteins to get to that same amount of leucine to trigger, to trigger muscle protein synthesis. So there's nothing wrong with plant proteins, but um, just the amount of calories you're going to have to eat is going to be significantly higher to hit that same amount of leucine and build muscle than you would versus if you just ate animal foods. Um, and once again, that's not to say anything necessarily bad about them, but it just depends on your goals. And, you know, let's say you have issues digesting meat, then maybe you have to be vegan. So you're just, it's probably best that you supplement with a soy protein powder because that's going to be able to, that's going to help you hit your protein targets. And plus they generally, adjust the amino acids in there, right? They put in amino acids so that way they're more readily available. Um, so you may ask, why can't you just sit there and sip BCAAs, branched chain amino acids powder all day and not eat any proteins just fast? Good question. But the problem is you won't have the building blocks. You may have the amino acids, but the proteins themselves are what complete those amino acids essentially. And this is all pretty rough and granular and I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. This is just stuff I've picked up from listening to experts for the last couple of years because um, I've wanted to learn about building as much lean mass as possible, the human metabolism, the human body. Um, so yeah, if you fast as well, um, it's the same deal. You may get a transient uprise in human growth factor or uh, into like growth factor, right? Um, people make a big deal about this, but your body's using calories from stored fat to circulate and give you energy. So it has to increase growth hormone to make use of those fats, right? And your body has to go through a real long process to make that into energy. So there's nothing wrong with that, but fasting is not anabolic. The only reason why the growth hormone goes up is once again, to make more energy and get more use from the fat tissue that you're now burning because you're no longer taking in exogenous fat, exogenous carbohydrate or exogenous protein. Um, I don't have any reference pulled up here, but as a general guideline to trigger muscle protein synthesis, you're going to want about 20 grams of protein in a meal. Um, now if you eat more, it's not going to waste, but to kind of get the minimum effect, it's about 20 to 25 grams of animal source protein for plant proteins. Um, it's going to be a little bit higher just to get to that right amount. So that way you can become anabolic and start building contractile tissue and, you know, obviously given the right response, resistance training and stuff like that to uh, demand that your body essentially builds this contractile tissue. All right. So moving on from that, we're going to talk about newbie gains. Um, I got an article here from Steel Supplements. Um, I personally have never used their supplements, but I've seen them a lot and um, kind of would like to try. So we'll just kind of read through this. We're not going to read through the whole article, but I just kind of want everybody to have an idea of you know, kind of what to expect starting out. And we'll get into a little bit more science after this. Um, are you someone who's just getting started on their muscle building journey, but is somewhat nervous to get started? If so, don't be, because as a beginner, the odds that you make huge muscle gains are in your favor. Um, this is all thanks to a concept called beginner gains, also known as newbie gains. Newbie gains refer to beginner lifters being able to build bigger muscles at a faster pace than more experienced lifters. Newbie lifters rejoice. <laughs> If you're a newbie lifter, here's everything you need to know about newbie gains, including how long you can expect your beginner advantages to last. Um, so anybody who's just started to work out, or at least everybody that I know, I'm sure there's some exceptions to this rule, obviously, um, you can expect to see dramatic muscle growth within those first six months to a year. Um, and from what I understand, you'll gain about 50% of all the muscle you're ever going to gain in your entire life within your first year. Now you may ask, why is that? The reason that is, is because you're providing a new stimulus to your body, a stimulus that your body has not yet become accustomed to. So we can also kind of level this at cardio as well. Um, cardio training, I'm not against cardio, but I am against excessive cardio. Um, 
So when you first start resistance training, your body is getting the stimulus that there is a deficit of muscle, right? You're pulling on stuff. You're doing physical activity that requires contractile tissue to overcome the resistance of. So when given that stimulus and sufficient protein, um, your body is going to therefore take that stimulus and start to build contractile tissue. So that way, the next time you experience that, um, you're able to overcome it, right? So think about back to our ancestors, they would, you know, it, it would benefit us to have muscle mass and benefit us to become stronger so that way things don't kill us, right? And it, it's also good to a point, and there's a reason why there's um, a, a hormone in your body called myostatin. Myostatin inhibits muscle growth because too much muscle could be a bad thing, right? If you're like Ronnie Coleman, then you may not be as athletic as um, you know, some Olympic weightlifters or the uh, guys who run marathons, because it wouldn't benefit you to do that. So kind of tag it back onto the cardio thing. If you do excessive cardio, then you're sending your body the wrong signal. It's not going to be able to build muscle. Well, I shouldn't say wrong signal, but depending on your goals, if you're doing excessive cardio, then your body's going to want to get rid of muscle because muscle is very oxygen and blood heavy, or it consumes a lot of that, right? So when you start doing push-ups, pull-ups, right, just hitting them or doing bicep curls, anything like that, anything that requires a lot of effort, um, your blood has to be oxygenated to put blood to that um, connective tissue so that way it can perform that exercise, right? So when you're running, you have to increase your heart rate and you have to breathe more so that way you can get more oxygen to your legs. But the problem is that, that in excess, we'll actually start to strip away that tissue because you're providing the stimulus telling your body that, hey, we got to get rid of this muscle stuff because I'm not good at running. So that's not to say you shouldn't do cardio, but depending on your goals, you should just watch what kind of cardio you're doing. You don't want to do these all out sprints for hours and hours and hours on end. You don't want to do this steady state cardio for hours and hours and hours on end. If you're looking to build as much lean mass as possible, you could still do it, but don't kill yourself doing it. Um, from what I understand, a good rule of thumb is probably like a half hour or so at most only three or four times a week. No, it's not so you can't go walking. I'm a huge advocate for walking. And I'm sure anybody who listens to this podcast knows that I'm a huge advocate for walking. But any kind of hard on your body, especially if you're sore, um, then you're doing way too much cardio. You're, you're now starting to become a little bit more catabolic. Your body's going to get rid of some lean tissue because it wants you to adapt to the given stimulus. Um, so sorry, I kind of got on a long tangent there about cardio, but I just hope that everybody understands just kind of assess your own individual goals and find what you want to do and then, you know, exercise accordingly. So what are newbie gains or beginner gains? Um, have you ever watched weight loss shows such as The Biggest Loser? If so, you have ever have you ever been amazed at how contestants often drop 10, 15, or even 20 pounds in their first week of training? If so, you were witnessing the newbie gains phenomena in action. Um, this kind of may seem like it's contradicting my point earlier, but um, you don't necessarily have to be in a caloric deficit when you first start training to lose fat. Now people are going to come out and say, oh, it's still calories in, calories out or whatever. Um, yes, it's still calories in, calories out. But the thing is, you're giving your body a new stimulus so it actually can start to shuttle some of those calories from, from your stored body fat over to build muscle. Therefore, you will do what's called recomp or recomposition. You will lose body fat and build muscle because once again, you have not had that stimulus yet. Excuse me. You have not had that stimulus yet. So your body's going to cycle whatever calories it can from wherever exogenous or stored body fat to build that contractile tissue that you're giving it the stimulus through resistance training to build. Um, newbie gains is something that people new to exercise will likely experience when they're first training shows like the biggest loser demonstrate how newbies can experience rapid weight loss shortly after starting training, but newbie gains is related to more than just weight loss. Beginner lifters can also experience rapid muscle gain shortly after starting to lift weights. Even if their lifting sessions aren't all that tense, the gains you see are often astounding, whether it's rapid weight loss or strength gains, it all comes back to the concept of newbie, newbie gains. Unfortunately, like many good things, newbie gains don't last forever. After a beginner has spent a certain amount of time in the gym, 
that rapid increase in muscle gains begins to slow down. Specifically, after about one year of lifting, newbies typically start to see those easy gains subside. For people who have been lifting for years on end now, this all might seem a little unfair, and we will say that it can be a struggle to see a newbie walk into the gym and make massive gains in what seems like overnight. For newbies, though, seeing those gains can be a big motivation to keep showing up to the gym every day. Here's exactly how newbie gains work. Um, so they're going to continue on here. But yeah, anyone who's worked out or just started to work out, you'll definitely notice the newbie gains. I, I did it, and um, yeah, it, it's pretty cool to see the weight go up on the bar and see your muscles get weight pumped up, and you just build muscle like crazy but once again that eventually goes away because your body will start to it won't want to build any more contractile tissue because it realizes that the stimulus you know you've you've kind of wrung out the rag so to say right um your body doesn't want to put on too much muscle because once again it, it may not be advantageous for your survival because Back in, you know, when our ancestors were chasing down woolly mammoths and hunting them into extinction, um, it would only benefit them so much to be so muscular because muscle is very calorically expensive, right? Your body would need a lot of calories to maintain that muscle mass. So, yeah, we look at it today and we think, well, we want to be super big so that way we can eat a whole ton. Well, your body doesn't always want that because it may end up being that you, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to maintain that mass. Your body's going to want to kind of keep you in this homeostasis per se, right? Um, so how do you build muscle in the first place? The way that your body builds muscles is through a process called hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is when the size of your muscle increases due to continuously challenging them with resistance training. When you practice resistance training, including weightlifting, hypertrophy initiates a cascade or and a cascade of events occur in the body where one event causes the next. Those events or those events include muscle fibers break down, certain hormones, including testosterone, human growth hormone activates, and muscle protein synthesis initiates. The key event for muscle growth is muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein synth synthesis, Jesus. I say that six times very fast. <laughs> muscle protein synthesis initiates to help repair broken down amino acids in muscle tissues and fibers. The tissues and fibers get broken down from working out, then the tissues get rebuilt during muscle protein synthesis. Um, when they're repaired, they're rebuilt to be stronger than what they were when they first broke down. That is at least if your diet includes enough protein and calories to support muscle growth. But when you have more than enough protein and calories, and then the rebuilt muscle fibers will be larger than what they were before you worked out. So the key to muscle growth is muscle protein synthesis, which stimulates muscle growth, given that you're meeting certain dietary needs. But this doesn't explain why beginners experience such big gains right off the bat. Read on to see how muscle protein synthesis is on the side of newbies. So once again, they're kind of explaining here that when you train, you're breaking down muscle tissue, right? beating the heck out of it. You're doing pull-ups, you're doing deadlifts till failure, you're bench pressing and your chest is all pumped up. You're sore. You can't lift your toothbrush to brush your teeth. Um, your body realizes that you need to overcome this stress. You're imposing a demand on your body and therefore you're going to have to eat enough calories and protein, amino acids, right? To build that contractile tissue. So that way, next time you're going there and you're going to bench press. till your shirt bursts because your pecs are so pumped up. Um, and your boys want to rebuild those a little bit better. So that way you come back and say, well, these two plates on each side ain't nothing. Let's, you know, let's keep rocking and rolling. Um, what causes newbie gains? Technically, the way you build newbie gains is the same way you build post newbie gains. It's just that hypertrophy is hyperactive when you're a newbie. So why is hypertrophy so powerful during the first year or so lifting? When you're a beginner to weight training, cardio, or any other type of exercise, your body enters somewhat a state of shock. Not used to the breakdown of muscle fibers, hypertrophy goes into overdrive to rebuild broken down tissues. As a result, muscle protein synthesis occurs at an extremely high rate, which leads to big muscle gains in a short period. Not only that, but newbies commonly experience rapid body fat loss in addition to muscle gain. This rapid uptick in muscle protein synthesis inevitably increases the amount of muscle on your body, hence why people in their first year of training usually make significantly more gains than people who are perhaps years into their training program, right? So I'm sure you'll see after a while, people begin to not necessarily look too much different because once again, that the, your body has grown accustomed to this demand. So as you train longer and longer, you need to start imposing more demand on it through time under tension, progressive overload, 
or just increasing the weight, which would be either a mixture of the two to um, impose greater demand on your muscles so that way you can tell your body, hey, we need more muscle. Once again, once you've been lifting for a few years, it's going to be harder to build muscle because your body is just going to naturally fight you. Um, so I will leave this article in the show notes just in case anybody kind of wants to read on and, um, you know, kind of see more of what's going on here. So this is a paper from the legendary Don Lehman, if I remember correctly. Let me make sure this is it. Yes. Um, Don Lehman is one of the world's leading prote protein researchers. Um, he's been on a ton of podcasts. Just look him up on YouTube and you'll kind of find all the uh, information you need. And he really lays this stuff out. I mean, he is an absolute genius. Um, so we're just going to kind of skip to here. Um, the RDA for protein, in my opinion, is pretty low because protein, once again, in my opinion, is the most important macronutrient because it's the most satiating, it helps build lean tissue, and it's responsible for so many different functions in your body that we really should be going out of our way to target protein. Now, that's not to say that every person needs to eat, you know, 800 grams of protein a day and one carb and five grams of fat. If you do that, you'll likely run into a lot of issues pretty quickly. Um, so they asked the question in this research paper here, and once again, I will link this below. Um, protein is a form of nitrogen. So just before we kind of get rock and roll in here, just so you guys understand, um, is the RDA recommended daily allowance really the best measure of dietary protein needs? Nitrogen balance is a conventional measure of protein needs used in crafting the RDA, and it reflects efficiency of nitrogen retention under conditions of energy balance. Right, so that's when you're eating at a caloric maintenance. You're not gaining or losing weight. You're about staying the same. In this context, additional protein intake above that required for attaining nitrogen balance has been viewed as unnecessarily or, or unnecessary or possibly unsafe. Right, they say that um, if you eat excessive protein, then you may damage your kidneys. That's because um, your kidneys have to discrete that um, blood urea and nitrogen. Right, if you eat a lot of protein, then if you get a blood test, you may see that your BUN, blood urea and nitrogen levels are a little bit high. Um, and people have a high protein diet that's perfectly normal. And obviously I'm not a doctor. If you're really concerned about it, go talk to a doctor, show them your blood test and they can do all that. I'm, I can't help you here. <laughs> um, the RDA for both men and women under 19 years old is 0.8 grams high quality protein per, gil, per kilogram of body weight per day. And it's based on the minim minimum dietary protein required to achieve nitrogen balance. Nitrogen losses reflect the daily requirement to replace essential amino acids, plus the degradation pathways and are estimated by collection of nitrogen in urine, stool, breath, skin, hair, and extrapolated dietary protein. Right? So whenever you pee, whenever you go to the bathroom, whatever, or even your hair and skin, that's all made up of different proteins. So collagen is a really, really popular protein. And actually, funny enough, that's actually a pretty poor form of protein because the leucine is very low. So if you eat a whole ton of collagen, then you actually may not trigger muscle protein synthesis because the leucine content in that protein isn't actually high enough to trigger that. So you would have to eat a lot of collagen before you get to um, <clears throat> achieve muscle protein synthesis. Um, and also if you eat a lot of protein, then you excrete more um, nitrogen in your urine. Um, so for estimation of the RDA, or more specifically, the estimated average requirement, EAR, dietary protein is titrated down to the minimum amount that allows the body to achieve nitrogen balance and use a monolinear regression to calculate a break point for the EAR. This represents an obligatory rate of amino acid degradation. However, the rate of nitrogen loss has no direct relation to other metabolic roles of amino acids. Inherent in the nitrogen balance approach is the assumption that dietary goals for protein intake equate with efficiency of amino acid use for nitrogen containing molecules only. The singular focus on attaining the lowest possible amino acid oxida oxidation suggests that increasing the intracellular concentrations of amino acids or their keto acid carbon skeletons are unnecessary and perhaps unfavorable. Um, kind of what they're talking about here is that um, just eating the minimum amount of protein, yeah, you may be at maintenance, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's optimal. You're going to want to increase your protein intake, especially when you're lifting, so that way you can be in a net nitrogen excess. So that way that can be used to rebuild connective tissue muscle 
or contractile tissue, muscle, right? Whenever you work out, once again, you're breaking that tissue down and the protein is going to be the building blocks to build it back up. So um, when it comes to muscle building, you want to be right around one or um, a gram of protein per pound, pound of body weight, right? Some people say ideal body weight. I just one gram of protein per pound of body weight will put you right where you need to be. In fact, I would bet if all the obese or heavier people in America would just increase their protein intake and walk after meals, they would be more than halfway to, you know, being in much, much, much better health. And that's pretty easy to do, I think. Um, some people may disagree, but, you know, that's just my opinion. And I see a lot of help in doing that myself. Although the RDA may, may represent a minimum amino acid requirement for most healthy individuals, higher intakes of essential amino acids, EAAs, or indispensable amino acids may impart metabolic benefits, including improved body composition, right? You're building more contractile tissue, so therefore you will have less fat tissue, and you're going to be able to eat more calories because, once again, muscle is very calorically expensive. Um, they talk about maintenance, growth, or function of lean mass, enhanced satiety, Increased thermogenesis, so basically that's calories expended by just digesting the food, um, just to kind of go on a small side tangent here, but if you eat 10 calories of protein, then 30% of that, of those calories are going to be used in just digesting that protein, right? So when you eat 10 grams of protein, um, that's going to be 40 calories, while 30% of that is going to be you know, use digestion. So, you know, 10 calories of protein, you're only getting seven calories from that total. Now that's not to say that protein calories don't count. They still do, but, um, the thermic effect of feeding, um, reduces the amount of net calories. If you kind of follow what I'm saying there, um, sorry, I kind of stopped right in the middle of the sentence, um, increased thermogenesis or improved glycemic regulation. So, um, when you eat, your body secretes insulin, right? To help kind of clear the food from your stomach and then clear all the sugars and everything else in your bloodstream, you're going to spike your insulin, right? Um, now, some people theorize that um, when you spike your insulin, you stop burning fat, which is true, but you're still, your overall body weight is going to be a matter of calories, Right. So just because your body stops burning fat doesn't mean that you're not losing weight or you're gaining weight, right? And there's uh, tons of debates on this. I'm not going to go into that here because first of all, not only am I not knowledgeable enough to completely break down all these subjects, but I mean, that's just a long freaking rabbit hole to go on. But um, so when you spike your insulin, then, you know, you may feel a little bit of that high, you may feel a little bit more energetic, but then when your insulin comes back down to baseline, then you get tired, right? People talk about the food coma. Um, that's because your blood sugar spikes and then it goes back down. So um, they're saying here essentially that when you eat protein and this bears out in the literature as well, um, it's going to help, you know, blunt that glycemic response, that insulin spike and crash. So when you're eating your meals, this is just a little tip, and I found this to be really, really interesting. I think Rob Wolf, when I had him on, kind of talked about this, but it's very, very important. Um, try to tar eat your protein first, and sometimes it's not always possible. You know, you eat like a hamburger or something like that, you're going to have a bun and then the burger in the middle. But um, let's say you get steak, potatoes, and I don't know, pickles, let's say. You're going to want to eat that steak first because that's going to be all your protein and fats. And then when you eat the potatoes and the pickles, those are your carbohydrates. Um, eating that protein first will actually help blunt that insulin response so you don't get that surge and crash. And walking after meals will actually help regulate your blood sugar and it will help with digestion as well. So there's just a little bit of tips for whenever you're thinking about losing weight or just kind of anything in this realm. Um, I definitely try to do the walks after meals. I find that I feel great and helps my digestion um, a lot when I do those. So, um, you know, it's cold here in Pennsylvania right now. It's January 30th, 2022. And uh, I just hop on the treadmill and walk for a little bit. So that's kind of how I get my walk in after I eat. Um, 
um, improve glycemic regulation and may aid in recovery after trauma, surgery, or prolonged bed rest. So to go on a little bit of tangent there too, once again, that's because the protein is the building blocks for you to build new tissue. So if you, let's say, did have a severe cut, you had a surgery or something like that, then keeping a high protein intake will help your body kind of repair all that, right? The building blocks are protein. Um, variables related to muscle mass, strength, and metabolic function have been proposed as other relevant endpoints. Furthermore, nitrogen balance and amino acid oxidation provide estimates of total daily amino acid needs, but do not address the distribution of protein intake at individual meals. Many of the metabolic roles of amino acids support targeting the quantity of dietary amino acids or protein needs at individual meals distributed throughout the day, as opposed to net daily recommendations or an overall percentage of daily energy intake. Um, I don't want to beat on this too much because you'll you know, it, fasc it fascinates me, but for the average person, this may be a little too granular, but um. When you eat and you get that insulin response, um, muscle protein synthesis kind of max out at about two hours. So in order to optimize muscle protein synthesis throughout the day, you kind of want to eat every, let's say, three to four hours. And that's not to tell everybody that you should be sitting here chugging a whey protein shake, you know, all throughout the day or every two hours. But um, three square meals a day is fine. Um, even the intermittent fasting is fine, but just understand that there's a lot of literature out there now to suggest that when you intermittently fast, it may not be the best way to build muscle or to even maintain that muscle because you're not getting the bonus of triggering muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. Um, I used to do it, but I no longer because the evidence has come out essentially against intermittent fasting. And that's not to say that I'm against it personally. But, um, you know, it, it's all tools in a tool belt. If it helps you maintain whatever goal you want to get to, fine. But if not, then just reconsider it. That's all. Um, so once again, optimally would be every three to four hours, you get a bolus of protein in. So that way you can keep, um, you could stay essentially anabolic and keep building muscle throughout the day when given the sufficient stimulus and sufficient protein. Um but three meals a day is perfectly fine for the average person. And honestly, in my opinion, skipping breakfast um, does not seem to help me with maintaining um, being satiated throughout the day. I just feel like I, I get hungry if I don't eat in the morning. And I used to skip breakfast, but I no longer do that. Um, breakfast is normally my biggest meal of the day. And I find that I feel a lot better um, eating breakfast. So personally, if you were going to intermittently fast, then um, I would recommend kind of doing like a early morning, you know, like a breakfast and then maybe a late lunch. You know, when I used to do intermittent fasting when I was carnivore, I would eat, yeah, everybody, <laughs> my dog sniffing me. Um, when I would intermittent fast, I would eat about five to 5.30 in the morning and I would stop eating by about lunchtime. So that way you go to bed on an empty stomach and um, your body is able to rest and recover the best on a more so empty stomach, right? And um, your body doesn't have to use blood or anything like that to help digestion while you're sleeping. So just something to consider. Um, personally, I try not to eat actually past 6, 630, because I go to bed normally around eight o'clock to nine o'clock every night. Um, just my personal opinion. And there's no necessarily uh, data or anything to back up why I do this. It's just what works best for me in my schedule. Um, whatever works for you is whatever works for you. Um, so here's a graph from, um, let me make sure I got this right, um, PJ Atherton. Once again, I will link this below. Um, here, this is a graph kind of displaying um, mTOR insulin and all that. So um, mTOR is the mammalian target of rapamycin. So basically, this is um, part of the process that helps build muscle. Um, so when you eat like I was saying earlier, your blood sugar and your insulin is going to spike. And that's going to help contribute in part to building muscle because you're, you know, digesting food and it's getting out into the bloodstream and whatever your body does. Once again, not an expert on this stuff. It's just what I've picked up throughout the years from learning. So what of a role for insulin in regulating anabolic responses to nutrition via nutrient induced secretion? While it is noteworthy that provisions of protein alone without carbohydrate cause a rise in insulin similar to that seen following a mixed meal, insulin apparently does not contribute to the anabolic effects of EAAs 
on muscle protein synthesis. So once again, this is essential amino acids on muscle protein synthesis. To exemplify this, essential amino acids infusates robustly stimulate muscle protein synthesis even when insulin is clamped at post-absorptive concentrations. Um, however, this does not mean that there's no postprandial anabolic role for insulin. Indeed, in addition to the threefold rise in muscle protein synthesis, <laughs> there's also significant antiproteolytic effect on feeding skeletal muscle, which is apparently entirely attributable to insulin. To illustrate this, a rise in insulin, just 15 IU, um, or IU per milliliter, is sufficient to mimic 50% of the inhibition of MPB and be the maximal effect size caused by a mixed meal. Moreover, this anti-catabolic effect cannot be recapitulated via a large dose of amino acid infusions when insulin is clamped at post-absorptive concentrations. Thus, to summarize, essential amino acids regulates anabolic responses via large increases in muscle protein synthesis, while insulin releases regulate anti-catabolic responses. It follows that as the change in muscle protein synthesis is far greater than that in MPB or MPS is a major driving force behind nutrient induced anabolism. So basically that's just to say that um, essential amino acids and protein are the main driver when you get that insulin spike through protein to build muscle. So if you just sit there and eat a whole ton of white rice, cause it doesn't have any protein, you may get a spike in insulin, but that spike in insulin isn't going to build any muscle. You need, once again, the building blocks, you need protein. Um, so now we're going to shift over to recommendations on training and we'll even kind of review what I do and, um, you know, personal recommendations that I can maybe make for everyone out there. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, anything like that, drop me a message and I'm, I'll do my best to kind of help you out and maybe steer you in the right direction if you have questions about training. So um, this is a pretty long paper and they kind of review Stop. This is by Brett, Con or uh, not Brett Contreras, Brad Schoenfeld, who's probably one of the leading researchers in um, muscle. Um, I go to him just about for everything when it comes to muscle building, and he's incredibly smart. Um, right here, it says there's compelling evidence that RT volume. Oh, I forgot what the heck that means. That's all right. Um, <laughs> is a is a primary driver of hypertrophy with higher volume showing greater increases in muscle growth. It therefore follows that those seeking to maximize hypertrophy should train with multi-set protocols based on current literature, 10 plus, set or 10 plus sets per muscle per week would seem to be a good starting point as to programming volume <clears throat> in those with hypertrophic oriented goals. Volume should then be manipulated based on individual response. That said, substantial gains can nevertheless be achieved with volumes as low as four or fewer sets per muscle per week. Those who are time pressed lower volume routines represent a viable option to balance efficiency with results. Given that consistently training with high volume has been purported to hasten the onset of overtraining, it could be hypothesized that periodizing volume may enhance hypertrophy. Therefore, ongoing discussion of high versus low um, training volume does not need to be binary. Rather, a combination of both approaches might be optimal for a long term strategy that would allow constant progression. Um, just kind of wanted to read on that. I'll link this in the show notes as well. Um, so for me personally, um, I used to do like a, what they would call bro split. If you watch my episode of the Rob Goodwin, he does a, he calls it the pro split because, um, his belief is that when you beat the hell out of your muscle and you give it time to recover, um, you're definitely be ready for a real hard training session later on or in the following weeks. So, um, I do a six day training or six days a week training split. And we'll kind of review that right now. So let me make sure I got this up. Okay. So this is just kind of the days and you repeat this on the following three days and my day off is Saturday. So as you can see here, and this isn't always 100% accurate, but this is kind of a loose idea. And you may see here, it says to failure. If you're a newbie, it's probably not recommended that you go to failure because the fatigue is going to be so great and you're going to be so sore, you may not be recovered for your next workout. So um, since I'm more of a, I don't want to say advanced lifter, but more experienced, um, I really need to beat the heck out of myself per se to um, make sure that I'm going harder than last time to tell my body, look, you need to grow muscle. So going to failure for me is a little bit more important than somebody who's new to lifting. Um, when you're experiencing the newbie gains, it's not really quite as important to uh, 
um, go to absolute failure. So um, it is Sunday right now. So I did a workout very, very, very similar to this today. It wasn't exact, but this is pretty close. But once again, you can kind of play with it yourself and see what exercise feel best and work best for you. So Sunday, we start off with an incline chest press, three sets of 12, um, dumbbell kickbacks, which is going to work your triceps, three by 12. And then I superset these, right? Superset everything. So I start off, I'll hit the uh, chest press, and then I'll do the uh, dumbbell kickback. So that's basically where you grab a dumbbell and extend your arm backwards and work the tricep. So I'm hitting the chest and triceps. So then I move on and I go ahead, do the tricep or the overhead press. So that's going to be for your shoulders. Grab the barbell, press overhead, back down um, with a tricep rope extension. So you, I'm sure you've seen everybody grab the ropes and extend their arms. Um, so three sets of eight for the overhead press and then the tricep rope extension, um, two sets of 12 and one set to failure. Um, so once I do that, I'm done working triceps for the day. And then my last workout is going to be the lateral raises. So that's where you grab dumbbells and lift your arms up like that, right? To work the, uh, side delt. It's called your deltoid. You got three heads of the deltoid, the rear deltoid, lateral deltoid, and front delts. Um, I don't work my front delts individually because when you do chest workouts, it already hits them pretty good. So do the lateral raises two sets, 12, and then one set to failure and then incline dumbbell chest press, um, two by 12, one set to failure. I don't, I just realized I messed this up, but that's okay. Um, you'd swap that out with, let's say dips, which is where you kind of, you know, grab onto the handles and you could do push ups or whatever. Something that's just going to target the chest. Um, but as you can see, this last set, two by 12, one set to failure. So I'll start off with like 65 pounds, go till I can't do another rep with proper form, put the weights down. I'll go lower the weight a little bit, do the same thing, just like two times, just to really not fatigue myself. But once again, once you do these sets to failure, you're done. You know, leave the muscle alone until your next training day or until the following week, however you plan to train. Tomorrow will be Monday, which is my pool workout, right? I do a push-pull leg split. So I hit every muscle in my body two times a week. Um, it's an easy way to not spend hours and hours and hours in the gym. You can kind of split it up throughout the week. And there's evidence to suggest that, once again, when you spread out your training, you get a more anabolic response because you're triggering those muscles more than just once a week. Um, generally, it seems like overall volume is kind of the driver but when you split it up, it's, you don't have to spend as long in the gym. Do you follow what I'm saying? So Monday, um, I start off with deadlifts and I like the heavy compound lifts because, um, it's a big signal and it, you know, releases a lot of growth hormone and testosterone. So it's really important to get those compound lifts in. Um, you may have seen, I don't really bench press, but I do chest press. Um, I just find that holding dumbbells feels a little bit more natural for me. Um, I do chest press with uh, my X3 bar, which I may do a whole podcast and kind of review my thoughts around that um, at a later date, but that's not today. So Monday deadlift six sets, first three sets are warm ups, and then three to five or three by five to eight reps. So um, generally those six sets, I'll start off with one plate on each side. So that'll be about 135 pounds. I usually bust out about 15 reps really comfortably just to make sure that I'm ready to rock and roll and really kind of get in the training, um, just warm up because if I slap five plates on each side, try to do rep, I'd probably get injured because I'm, I'm not warmed up yet. So, you know, I'll start off, do my 15 deadlifts with, um, 135 pounds. And then, um, as you can see here, I have the first three deadlift sets. I'll do like chin-ups or bicep curls, right? So that way I'm staying efficient with my time. And also you're not really working your biceps or your lats, as I'm going to talk about here in a second, when you're doing uh, deadlifts. So the first three sets, I kind of work up. So I'll do one plate on each side, two plates on each side, two plates, 12 reps, and then three plates on each side, maybe eight to 10 reps, depending on how I'm feeling. And then after those first, you know, three sets of deadlifts, I also did the three sets of chin-ups, you know, palms facing you, pull-ups, mostly works the bicep um, or bicep curls works the bicep or, you know, I'll do lat pull downs or dumbbell rows, which, you know, to work your lats, which are the muscles in your back, which are one of the biggest muscles in your body. Um, I'll work those for the last three sets of deadlifts. So the three by five to eight reps, um, normally I'll do um, four plates on each side, 
five reps or I'll do three plates on each side for eight reps. Um, just depends on how I'm feeling. If I'm feeling pretty, uh, like a pretty good go-getter then I'll do, you know, four or five for five, um, three sets of that. And, uh, you know, kind of keep rocking and rolling. So then once I do all those, I start to work, I do the shrugs, right? So that's to work your traps. So that way your shoulders kind of look bigger, right? Um, they're also really important for carrying stuff. So then I do, you know, another bicep exercise or weighted pull-ups, you know, two sets of eight to 12 and one set to failure. So if I'm doing bicep curls then I'll start peeling weight off and doing um, bicep curls so I can no longer, you know, lift my arms up and then leave them alone. So in between those bicep curl sets, I also do seated dumbbell shrugs or some kind of shrug to once again, work the traps. So, and then finishing out the uh, push workout, seated cable rows or lat pull downs, something like that to work the lats to, in two by 12 to 15, one set to absolute fatigue and then standing heavier shrugs. So I'll grab, let's say 80 pound dumbbells and just shrug to failure, go down to 60, do that and keep going. So then Tuesday here is my leg workout. Never skip leg day, you know, no matter what, because your leg strength is actually correlated very, very well with longevity as well. So it's very, very important. You know, we all hear the jokes about people breaking hips when they get old, but it's important. You should work out your legs. I mean, those are the things that freaking move you every day. What the hell, man? <laughs> so Tuesday, I do a barbell squat, which is where you put the barbell on your back and I'll do three sets, generally increasing in weight. So I'll start off, with, you know, one plate on each side, 135 pounds, bust out, you know, 15, maybe even 20 reps, and then put 25s on each side. So that'd be 185, bust out, you know, eight to 12 reps, eight to 15 reps, something like that. And then the final set, if I'm feeling really frisky, <laughs> I'll go to um, two plates on each side with 25s, and maybe I'll do five reps, that would be 265. So 265 pounds for five reps. And in between that, I'll do Romanian deadlifts, which are where you keep your legs nice and stiff or a one-legged deadlift, which is where you basically lift up your legs to work your hamstrings. So I'm working my quadriceps, which are leg, you know, the muscles on the front of your thighs and my hamstrings, which are the uh, muscles in the back of your thigh, which are actually responsible for a lot of the walking, jumping, stuff like that. So it's very important you work your hamstrings, even though you may not see them. So I'll start off the uh, leg day with those. And then um, to work the glutes, which is your ass muscles <laughs> and uh, your calves. So single leg step up. So that's kind of where you have a platform in front of you and you step up. Really want to make sure that you're um, squeezing your butt cheeks, essentially, to train the glutes. It's very important because that's, you know, used for hinging at the hips. Um, or I'll do kind of high single leg leg press. So if you think of a leg press machine, you would essentially have your heel on the uh, machine and maybe have your toes even over top. I find that that for me personally really hits my glutes. Still get a little bit of uh, quad work, but I really like to hit those anyways. Um, so once again, we're supersetting everything. Um, seated calf raise sit down the machine and you know just basically push your toes down towards the floor to really um, get a good workout in your calves and push a lot of blood in the calves. So um, the reps aren't all that important. It's just essentially whatever makes you feel more, more comfortable. The eight to like 15 rep range is generally preferable because that's when you're not at such low weight. That's not really a challenge. You just get more fatigue than actual resistance and too low. It's just going to be strength and you're not really going to be able to fatigue because it's going to be so hard to lift that weight. So, um, you know, once again, single leg step ups or high single leg press three to eight or three by eight reps, um, seated calf raise three by 12 to 15 reps. So then we go back to um, the kettlebell heels elevated goblet squat. So you hold a kettlebell up to your chest and then you elevate your heels, which can help really target your quadriceps and squat down. And, you know, I usually do um, two by 12 and then one set to failure, which this is absolutely miserable. Um, anybody who's ever tried to train your legs to failure, I'm sure they can attest it's it's pretty taxing and you may start to see stars because <laughs> you, so much blood has to be pumped out of your heart and your legs that it's like, whoo, you, you get a little dizzy. So um, I'll pair that with hamstring curls, which is where you lay down and then kind of bring your, 
you know, the whole lower half of your legs, your calves, your feet and everything up really hits a freaking hamstring. So both of these, once again, two by 12, one set to failure, hamstring curls, two by 12, one set to failure. And every time you decrease the weight. So um, for the heels elevated goblet squat, I'll start off with, let's say, I think going like a 75 to an 85 pound kettlebell. And I'll do squats to absolute fatigue on that last set. And then when I can no longer do it at that weight, I drop that kettlebell, drop the weight to half. So get a 40 pound kettlebell, do that. And then once I can no longer do that, then I just drop the weight altogether and do them till, you know, with body weight until I can't do them anymore. And when you do that, trust me, you'll be uh, kind of struggling to walk out of the gym. And if you drive a manual car, like I do, it sucks, <laughs> but you'll know it'll be worth it. Um, hamstring curls, same deal, absolute fatigue and uh, drop the weight. Same deal. Um, now, this is one of my favorite workouts right here is barbell um, hip thrust. So I generally use the Smith machine, put a bench behind your back, and basically it looks a little weird, but you're going to be thrusting your hips into the air and really squeeze your glutes, which are your butt cheeks, to really train them. Um, two sets of 10 and then one set to absolute fatigue. And then I like going to the leg press machine to do my calf raises. Um, and once again, two sets by 10, um, one set to absolute fatigue. Um, once again, just to kind of tell people, you don't always want to train to failure, especially if you're new, because the fatigue to benefit, you're just going to excessively fatigue yourself if you're a newer lifter going to failure. When you get more experience, you can tolerate that. You're not going to be as sore as often because once again, your body's more adapted to this given stimulus. So, uh, now you see that there's only three days here. I repeat this. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday is my second push workout. Thursday is my third or my second pull workout. And then Friday is my second leg workout. Um, yes, it sucks to do legs on, um, Friday, but, um, you know, legs gotta look good when the fiance and I are going out to eat, you know, can't, uh, once again, can't skip leg day. Um, so it's a pretty good workout template that I personally do. I'll try and see if I can copy and paste this into the show notes below just so that way we can get an idea, but, uh, you know, kind of play with them or do your own exercises here. You could even spread this out to like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday deal. If you're just starting out to lift and I guarantee you'll see great results. Um, I kind of wanted to touch on this as well, but, um, if you kind of notice the pattern here, if you were to do, um, if you mathematically do this out, you're going to see that this kind of goes over the uh, minimum recommended requirement for sets per muscle per week. So incline chest press three by 12, that's three sets. And then um, incline dumbbell chest press um, two by 12 once at the failure, that's six sets on my chest in just that one workout. And then I do it again, I get another six. So that's 12 sets per week um, hitting that muscle, right? So you're looking at the macro, essentially, the whole cycle throughout the week. I'm getting more sets of my chest in throughout the week. Um, and obviously, this is done for every single muscle. All muscles get hit 12 times or, you know, get 12 sets a week, which is that ideal range, as we read in that paper, to um, develop muscle. All right. So we'll hit stop share here and kind of close out. So um, that's my training plan. That's some information around protein and how much you should eat, how you should train, and kind of the basics in my understanding of protein metabolism and how you should eat and kind of design your training to best optimize developing muscle for newbies and as you get more experienced. Um, thank you, everybody, for paying attention to this episode. Um, I know this is a lot of science and a lot of stuff that people may not be used to hearing, but um, I think it's very important for people to kind of understand this, and especially if you're just beginning to start resistance training and you want to get better at what you do and you want to grow more muscle. Um, I think this is a great place to start. And I gave some resources that you guys kind of look into more yourself if you're interested in learning more. Um, let me know if you find this stuff interesting and if it helped you out. And um, I'll try to get more guests on to talk about this more in depth and give you more information so that way um, you can become a better version of yourself and you can develop more muscle throughout your life and hopefully be jacked and tan as long as possible. And, uh, you know, do plenty of great things. I, I do think it's very, very important that we make more jacked and tan libertarians because I would love to see more people who love liberty able to embody that freedom later into their life 
and not have to worry about depending on the state or um, anything like that towards the end of their life. So uh, once again, just let me know if you guys find these episodes useful and uh, give me some feedback if you can. Um, going into February, we got lots of cool stuff coming up, some return guests and um, hopefully a lot of roundtables that a lot of people get a lot of value out of. So um, subscribe, like it, share, um, whatever you got to do. I appreciate everybody listening. And until next time, everybody, take care.